Let me introduce the nature of this panel around building an agile workforce and a culture of learning. And we've got some phenomenal folks. So um, helping to anchor and moderate, let me read their names for you first, and then I'll bring them on stage together. Uh, Annie Bayou is our chief learning strategist at EdCast. Proud to call her my boss. She's going to help uh, orchestrate things for us today. Uh, she is joined by uh, Ganjan Argawal, the CHRO from Relix. Frédéric Hébert is our director, uh, head of digital learning, excuse me, uh, and innovation from Danon. Please make your way up here. Uh, Adrian Stevens, many of you heard him spoke, local in the area, VP of L&D for professional services. Uh, and last, but uh, certainly not least, Antoine Magin, a CLO from Mars. Please welcome all of you to the stage. So my name is Gunjan Agarwal. I've been in the people space for a long time, and uh, I joined Relics, which is, uh, uh, you may know, do you guys know LexisNexis? Have you heard of LexisNexis? It's a yes. business services company, okay. And uh, Reed Elsevier, so Reed Elsevier, LexisNexis, that's what Relic stands for. I joined them in uh, September of 2017. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about what we are doing on the broader people side as well as uh, then focusing on the, on the learning space. Um, and I'm going to do it really fast so we can uh, get back on the schedule. So just a little bit about, uh, about Relix. Um, it's a UK headquartered company. Um, it's about a $45 billion market cap. We have 30,000 employees. Majority of our employees are in uh, in United States, but then we do have our employees in uh, in company uh, in countries all over the world, um, and we have customers uh, as well in over 180 countries. Um, the the main thing I would say about Relix is uh, it's a company which has done a very very successful transformation. Uh, on its product and services side. So it used to be a publisher of, uh, um, of books, um, uh, journals, uh, and now essentially um, it has an entirely, the product uh, is a platform through which um, basically our customers are able to make better decision, decisions in their, in their uh, domains. Um, I like to call it, it's almost like a Google on steroids where scientists can go in and research uh, in their subject matter area and get much more um, insights, which is uh, powered by our um, technology and artificial intelligence and other aspects as well. So um, moving on to the HR side, we've been really busy in the, in the people space. So as our business has transformed and uh, um, has moved into a very, very digital decision-making products and platform, um, our people have also changed. So we have hired a lot more data scientists, a lot more engineers, a lot more technologists, product um, specialists. And uh, hence, uh, it has been really important for us on the people side as well to provide um, the kind of experience that uh, these um, uh, talented folks are used to when they walk into work for Relix. So we've been doing a lot of things. This is an eye chart, but essentially, uh, you know, we've been really building up our capabilities in analytics in the people side. We've been building our capabilities in the reward space, um, in talent development, primarily a lot of work in talent development, um, as well as in also kind of moving out transactional activities um, onto shared services to provide really strategic support to, uh, in terms of business partner support to our business. Uh, but the key aspect is really when you see in the bottom line, which is the employee. So all all of this work in the back end is really to ensure that the employee uh, has a fantastic experience when they are working um, in our company. And some key aspects of that um, that I'd like to highlight are that we really want to provide services and tools that allow for our employees to unlock their potential. So whatever knowledge, skills that they can gather so that they can be productive in the workspace, that is our main focus. So we want to build the infrastructure as well as capability in the people space to be able to allow for our employees to unlock their potential so that they feel empowered and inspired when they work with us. I, I, my vision and our team's vision is essentially 
anyone who comes and works in our organization, every day they spend and work in our organization, they are learning as much, if not more, they are having fun as much, if not more than they could anywhere else because they can walk out anywhere. These are really talented people. So that's kind of our vision. And we want to uh, create an experience where they we take away friction uh, when they are trying to learn, we take away friction when they are trying to do things, and we take away friction when they are when you know they make mistakes. So they should feel comfortable and inspired in our workplace. So then going on to the learning bit. Um, so building our learning technology as well as our uh, learning solution uh, is a very integral part of that vision so that our employees can access learning in a democratized way and it's learning which is meaningful for them. So we have uh, been working with EdCast and essentially you know, right from the moment the employee joins us on, and we have the onboarding um, work that we are we are doing right now together with EdCast. But essentially, there are pathways and journeys for our new employees when they walk into the organization, which helps support their onboarding into the organization, as well as supporting deep learning. So making sure that, for example, our data scientists, when they are looking to further enhance their skill set, we have the right kind of curated and blended learning available to them um, on the platform which they can access and, and utilize. Um, when you think about agile, so fast access to this learning is also an important aspect. So the learning is made available to them in the moment of their workflow. So if they are in um, wor working in or in Slack, uh, they can access the learning using Slack. So those that, those are some of the things we are working in terms of the design um, and uh, and ensuring that we again, like I said, take away friction. Uh, from the uh, from the learning aspect for our employees, um, there are quite a few other things as well. For example, we have initiated the whole capability building uh, by using a blended and curated learning manager as coach program. So it's not just the technical skills, but also more advanced people skills where we are um, we have uh, been experimenting with and getting really good NPS scores from the participants when they have um, uh, uh, taken this learning, which is online, but then also um, uh, we, um, we offer some uh, people touch as well to it. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip this, but uh, uh, the, the one thing I do want to share is if we come to this conversation, the big aspect, I mean, the big thing you have to think about as you look, think about your organizations, there is one bit which is what the employee sees, but then on the back end, how do you build your technology stack? And we have been really working through that. And I encourage you to also speak with our, uh, our talent leaders. We have our head of learning who's here, um, you can reach out to her and and learn more about uh, you know what the philosophy and thinking has been and with that I'm gonna now hand it over to my colleague so a few words about myself I'm Frederick Heber I'm part of the Danon company I'm leading the head of uh, learning digital learning for Danon and innovation a few words about myself so I've been in this industry for quite a decade uh, prior to that, I was in the uh, IT world, uh, and I like to define myself in few words like a millennial before the millennials. <laughs> so, <laughs> few words about Danon. So, I hope you know Danon because we have a large presence in the US. So, we have the first company worldwide in terms of uh, essential diary product with a f big footprint in the US, uh, number one in Europe in uh, advanced medical nutrition. Uh, and number two worldwide in terms of um, sorry early life nutrition and uh, package waters. <laughs> so we operate in uh, 120 countries in the world. We are more than 100 employees worldwide. Um, and so just to set the tone about who we are. Okay, so I hope you know this type of brands because it's quite famous in the US. Do you see these brands? Do you know them? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so it means we are doing our job properly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <coughs> agile workforce. That's a really good question. So when we discuss about this topic about agile workforce, it was quite uh, a big topic. And in fact, when we discuss, we move to this. 
which is at Danone you start with learning. So I liked this slide about having an house because when we start about agile workforce, we start first with having a really strong learning experience. For us, the learning experience, it's the ecosystem, the ways of working when it comes to learning, it needs to be the foundation of the else. Then the next stage of that, it's we need to build on the top of that the learning culture. If we don't have a strong learning experience, we will not be able to have a strong learning culture. And then the, the end game will be bringing an agile workforce. So today I will focus on these two elements, the learning experience that we are building right now at Danone and what we are doing in terms of learning culture. So we just launched a couple of months ago a new initiative called Campus 6, which is, we call that the new learning experience. So in Danone, we have a lot of solutions worldwide. So it used to be quite messy. People was not understanding what was learning. It was everywhere. So one of the first things we've decided to do is think about people to understand what's learning. So we have tried to unify all the system all around Danone under the same umbrella, which is what we call Campus 6. And the main entry things for Campus 6 is Edcast. Because of Edcast, one of the big things that we have seen with that is the capability to integrate everything under the same tool. So for the people, when they look for something, they don't have to think about where it is. They need to go to Campus 6, Edcast, and they will find everything they need. Now, when it comes to changing the learning culture, because now we have put in place kind of a strong learning experience with all the ecosystem, the solution, the partners under the same umbrella, now we have to work on the learning culture. And this is why we have launched several initiatives globally in parallel about how we can assemble this puzzle all together to, to make something very strong when it comes to our employees. So we have launched, I will say, I would say these four programs, but in fact, we have more than that. One is about one of the big initiatives that we have in Danone, it's called 1.1 Else. So the idea behind that, it's Danone at the end to become a B Corp for 2030. So we have a lot of challenges to train new employees behind that. So one of the things the company and the CEO decided is to give one share to all the Danone people to be able to participate, to co-build the strategy of the company. We have a lot of challenges about plastic, CO2, plant base, and we need to upskill our people to be able to decide what should be the company in the next five, 10 years. And for that, we're using Campus 6 to train them. We give them a lot of content. We have experts going on the platform, building password journey to be able to give this information, this insight to the people to be able to make their choice on where the company needs to go. So that's part of the first thing we've done at Danone to change the culture. Guys, you need to understand you're part of the company strategy. You need to do something and you need to learn about it. So this is one of the first things we have done. The second part is the leadership model. We reshape the leadership model and one of the big elements we've added to the leadership model is agility. The company has a lot of challenges about, you know, our consumer wants to change the way they consume of product. They want to have less, I would say, yogurt based on cow milk. They want much more yogurt based on plant-based. They want to have less plastic. Uh, so for us internally, we need to adapt. So it's quite challenging. When we have, been, we have done that for a couple of years, decades, and now we have two, three years to adapt, it's a big challenge. All the organization right now is going through this program to become a little bit more agile, to adjust, to see the new ways of working, how it's impact the, the business. One of the big also elements of culture, it's what we call emotion. So we started with all the executive team in Danone. So it means 250 people. They go to a three-day class where they need to change their mindset, understanding what <coughs> means agility, what is digital, what are the impact on the business, what's learning behind that, how it's important to be that. And one of the foundation of this program, it's at CAST. Then all needs to go to at CAST to understand, guys, you have this fabulous tool, you need to use it, and you need to explain to your team members that with this solution, they need to empower themselves to start learning by themselves and take the control of the career to really work on that and really create, I will say, emulation without, within, the, within the Danone. And now we have some babies, so we have a new one for operation, and we'll have now almost all function going to this program to really put the art of the learning culture into the business. We also have a new program called Digital for All. It means for every Danone, they need to get the basics 
of what digital means and impact for Danone from industrial point of view, from ways of working point of view. So we're rolling out this program right now into Edcast. It will be a yearly program. So that's one of the big, the, the, one of also the, the main thing we are doing. The last big thing, and it's quite unique in Danone, I don't know if you're doing Europe the same way, but we don't have any proper intranet or ways of working. Everything in Danone is, is doing through Facebook. So one of the largest users of Facebook, workplace, Facebook, workplace Facebook. And so the next big thing for us will be able to inject Edcast with this, this daily routine that people have. So really, they go on Facebook, they exchange on their project, they have their sub-project, -pro, sub and we'll be, able, we'll be able to inject this learning into them. And of course, I hope we'll be able to release soonly the new features that Carl introduced yesterday, because I think it's a, a nice way to also attract people that using Google to come back onto your own learning. Mm. And one more slide, I want you just to thank the team that have been working hard the last couple of months and show that we have deployed the solution, not at global level only, because in big companies, especially Danone, we are very, very decentralized. And when corporates decided to do something, it's, they all say, yes, yeah, super, corporate is coming with a new solution. And in fact, nothing is happening. So what we've done a lot, it's really go locally and talk to people and touch the people. So we have been spending, I would say, the three, four months of the launch of cast training all local people to change the way they approach learning and try to advocate to all the learning team. So we have some people in Brazil, some people in Poland, we have even cookies. So it's all local initiatives that has been done through the last couple of months to really say, guys, we have this new fabulous tool that can help you to develop, to upskill yourself, and you need to take it. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be in front of you to uh, share with humility a bit of a user case. So in uh, how we are attempting to build an agile workforce and culture of learning at Mars. So, um, well, we're in the US, so you are very familiar with Mars, an American company. Uh, you're all very familiar with our chocolate brands. You're probably less familiar with the fact that we're the number one pet care company in the world, both on pet food and on vet clinics. Mm -hmm. So actually, we have two big legs, the confectionery leg and the pet care leg, which uh, actually pet care is bigger than confectionery. So we're the number one worldwide in pet care, uh, vet hospitals, chewing gum, and chocolate. So we have 125 Saturn associates. Don't, don't, don't worry, the factories are totally split up, right? <laughs> so so uh, you're, you're very familiar with our brands. I mean, uh, you, you can see our, uh, we have a couple of $1 billion brands and, and uh, 100 years old. Basically, demographically, you're talking about 50,000 people in vet clinics. 35,000 people in supply, 25,000 people in sales. So that's a big three chunks of population that we have to deal with in terms of learning. So learning has always been at the heart of, uh, of mass. So if you look at our five principles, you know, efficiency is very much how, how do you have to upscale your workforce continuously to make sure that they can deal with the next wave of work you ask them to do. Um, Responsibility as a company, as a manager, is how you equip your, your employees to constantly be able to operate in, in a changing world with skill obsolescence, new business ventures. But it's also the associate, so we call our employees associate, by the way. So it's also the associate responsibility to own his or her development. We launched our new purpose at the beginning of the year. So the world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today, which is also congruent with our learning strategy, which is about building capability today for tomorrow. So enough about Mars. We uh, had a culture of learning, right? Uh, we do all the usual things that probably you guys are doing around after action review, meeting review, feedback loop, and da da da. But it was about how do you adapt your learning culture to the new reality? So like all of you, we have uh, key massing transformational challenges, whether it's uh, data analytics, change, agility, VUCA leadership, design thinking. And how do we bring this when actually the entire corporate university of Mars, Mars University, of course, um, is 
gear towards a functional lens, and let's so about trans transversal top <coughs> topics. So we also had uh, a very much face-to-face -face learning uh, culture, with 80% was done on a face-to-face -face basis uh, on the global and regional curriculum, which is around 1,000 learning SKUs for us. So we decided to embark ourselves in a strong curriculum modernization. So the overall of our curriculum, where we stop one third, retired one third, and basically update one third, keeping the other third and intact. And we had nothing really to embrace a full reach to allow people to own their development through personalized learning. Um, our reach was very debatable, so we actually decided to launch an LXP and we went for EDCA, so it's called My Mars U. So we launched that uh, a year ago uh, in September last year and through a phase approach it is currently live uh, for 43,000 associates, so globally including China, uh, factories, sales, vet clinics. Um, and well so far we have 58% uh, adoption, so we we're quite pleased with that. <laughs> And uh, you can see the picture of, of course, something quite familiar uh, with EdCAS. And what we wanted to start to really push forward is the transversal capability building. So, and, and to change that silo effect that we've observed in the last couple of years behind a functional lens only. So through core skills, but also uh, in agility at mass and, and many more. So that's uh, our attempt for democratizing learning and bringing uh, well, a contemporary experience with day-to-day -day learning for uh, a significant bulk of our, of our associates. So an example here is uh, us trying to change at pace and at scale uh, a few initiatives. So core skills, I mean, the world of uh, AI and digital actually has become not so much soft skills, but hard skills, exactly as uh, some of the, my predecessors uh, expressed. So if you take at the leadership college, which was the only transversal college we had, actually the, we have 15,000 line managers at Mass, and the reach of our leadership college was only 15% of the associate base. By launching a, a soft skill program, that, as I said, we called core skills, we suddenly have a reach of 100%. So all, literally all associates are in target for the key elements uh, of their soft skills. Then it's not enough if you're not tackling the line managers. So again, if you want your line managers to be part of this building agility and continuous learning, they also have to express to, I mean, to experience it themselves. And we totally redesigned the entire curriculum of the of the leadership college, including our um, uh, mandatory, in a way, uh, line management experience at Mars, which used to be done on two years with two full weeks of class classroom which never allowed us to have a decent reach because we had 47% reach of, of, of the target population. And because of this classroom-based focus, 60% pretty much of everything we were doing in our leadership was classroom-based. And just in a couple of, um, of months, actually, since we launched this great line measurement experience, suddenly, with all the other uh, overhauling of the leadership college, we are at only 15% uh, digital. Uh, delivery, which has moved actually the whole mastery from 80% face-to-face to 40% -face -to face-to-face, which excludes all the demand uh, element uh, that we can get through EdCast, and uh, a significant step change on, on the reach. Doing so, you of course save a lot of million, a lot of millions of dollars. So just that program only is a 12 million dollar saving on travel and expense, and we've accounted for the last two years on digital transformation of learning. We have already accumulated $50 million uh, from our sink. We don't want to exclude, actually, uh, the people in our factories. We've got 135 factories. And we launched POCA, sorry to talk about another provider, but, <laughs> and, uh, and this is actually allowing uh, reskilling and deep skilling for also the shop floor uh, associates who can, when through iPad actually experience, um, my, I mean, ability to debug uh, equipment issues or share across factories, uh, how to best manipulate this uh, wrapping machine or whatever you want. Huge excitement, actually, on the shop floor, uh, thanks to that. So those initiatives were for us what we call our hero SKUs 
to drive uh, a, a change of behavior fast, so at pace, and of course at scale, due to um, when we do things, they're always global, always cross-segment. So we did a survey with on Ed Gaz, that internally is called MyMarsu, as I said. Um, apparently, our uh, customers are happy because we've got 80% of uh, people telling us that um, the learning solutions do support their development. And we've got a net promoter scores of 80% for MyMarsu. Now, Ed Gaz might be delighted and claims that as a success of their tool. We claim that as a success of my team, hard work <laughs> to launch it fast and with some kind of competence. So, um, it's fine to try to, to, to build your learning culture or to reinvent your learning culture, as I said. Uh, we also need strong, uh, active sponsorship uh, at the top level. And, and uh, we also push for gamification. So, and uh, we launched, for instance, that's a small example. We launched a challenge, a MyMarsu learning challenge during summer when, uh, well, Europe just disappeared for four weeks. The Americans carry on working. And uh, we try. <laughs> We try to push uh, just by having five senior leaders uh, invited to publish five of their uh, learning materials online during the summer and pushing people to say, well, why don't you use the summertime to learn? We drove uh, adoption by 10% in just five weeks uh, with this uh, little challenge. And, uh, and people react very well to gamification. So what's next? What's next is uh, to launch what to expand is to 20,000 extra associates. We would like also to go beyond Mars and extend the value proposition to our key partners. Um, we still want to drive further this digital transformation, so target being at 20-person classroom only, excluding all the on-demand hours, and, and to drive uh, our associates to, um, to push them to, um, uh, to publish much more. So right, right now, it's only 1% of our users who are uploading content who would love to be around 5%. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the story I wanted to share on how we've tried to reinvent the learning culture at Mars through concrete examples. So thank you very much. All right, good morning. Uh, inspired to be here with you today, Adrian Stevens uh, from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I guess I'll keep the cultural exchange moving, being quarter Indian, quarter Chinese, and half Australian. <laughs> I'm told the Australian bit completely undermines any weight the film I might have brought to the table. But uh, thrilled to be with you. Uh, I did have responsibility for learning at HPE, a federated learning ecosystem, um, and today I have responsibility for talent management. But uh, in the spirit of what we're looking to do is we unpack the future of work, its opportunities and challenges, I'd like to share some context clearly on what we've been doing to build out an agile workforce, uh, really catapulted uh, by a culture of learning. So Hewlett Packard Enterprise, um, I imagine many of you are familiar with HP. Uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise really is the result of the separation of that company. I think it was the largest corporate separation some four years ago, done in about 11 months. And today, HPE is in place to advance the way people live and work. So a nice, compelling, transcendent purpose that we're looking to corral the workforce around. Um, what do we do? In essence, it is still technology. So providing technology solutions, our expertise, and a range of economic models to help our customers consume that meaningfully and at scale that in turn allows them to take advantage of the whole interplay today between the edge right through to the cloud. And our major strategic pivot is to provide all of those options and solutions as a service by 2022. So, you know, from turnaround to separation and into a really a constant state of transformation. Um, you can see here some of the outcomes. We are a B2B company. Um, but whether it's progressing, uh, you know, the research into Alzheimer's, looking at the mission to Mars, the supercomputers that were layering into the International Space Station and more, it does feel like a compelling time for the company and for our employees to get engaged around that, uh, that overall purpose. I mentioned transformation. I know it's a word that definitely we felt we were getting a little fatigued by, having been through so many cycles of it, but I think we all know it's a constant. And we have really looked to try and own the word now, to really embrace it. I think most of the research you'll see tends to show that enterprises that tend to have higher levels of engagement also have a higher correlation with change readiness. And when employees hear the term change, next, or transformation, they don't walk. They go, oh, okay, this is good, because we know it's a necessity to continue to progress. 
Um, for us, I've mentioned the separations, this merged spins forming two other companies, I think over a dozen acquisitions in the last two years alone, and that strategic pivot to everything as a service is very disruptive for the enterprise, and you can appreciate that creates ambiguity, uncertainty, um, and a degree of tension in the system. So we've had to really think about building out this agility by doubling down on leadership and our expectations of leaders and what it means to lead at the enterprise today and how that is different from what it might have been in the past. And then equally really investing in the overall environment uh, for our people and of course the experiences they have day to day. And what holds that together really is this fabric of culture. Um, I'm sure I missed last night with Kevin, but I imagine he would have spoken to some of the great research they're doing over at I4CP. Um, and my favorite interplay here is a little comic strip. You may have seen this one, apologies if you have. But I thought it said it all in terms of getting used to and at ease with this idea that transformation is a necessity. And it really does stem the continuity of what we're all striving to do with our companies. Um, so let's talk about leadership then, really starting at the top. Um, we had a beautiful inflection point two years ago with the new CEO, Antonio Neri, stepping into his responsibilities. 25 years with the company, having started in a call center in the Netherlands, originally from Argentina, couldn't speak English, and 25 years later, he is uh, leading the enterprise forward. So he himself really embodied that spirit of agility, of building out a career, taking risks, moving, and he is very key now to ensure that that experience that opportunity is available more broadly, tangibly, for anyone working at HPE. So with that in mind, we talked a little bit about the purpose. We have a new set of core beliefs that are kind of driving how it feels to work at HPE. Values, of course, linked to that cleanly, but I want to just pause for a second and talk about leadership specifically and what it means. From Antonio's perspective, you know, when we get our leaders together for alignment sessions, historically it's been about the company strategy and that hasn't changed today. We're making this remarkable pivot, but equally he wants leaders to leave these two day immersive experiences as passionate about the performance they can create, but equally passionate and feeling accountable for their people and their responsibility to develop their people, create organizations that are compelling for people to want to go join and through time ensure that the company can become again a magnet for talent in essence. So to do this, we've basically launched a new set of expectations for our leaders. Um, you know, you can group a whole raft of competence together into meaningful themes. We've cheekily all built it around the letter E because of the HPE, and they're all little square elements or boxes. So we have engage, empower, evolve, and execute. And I guess the one thing I would draw your attention to is you can see in here the emphasis points that help lead to building out the spirit of agility. So under engage, it's about en energizing others to collaborate, basically, working across boundaries, coming together to go problem solve and build, outcome, build outcomes. Empower, you can clearly see that a very strong emphasis on develop your people and enable them. So the removal of barriers, connecting them with the right resources, and again, spurring on this sense of momentum and agility that's so necessary. Evolve really is the learning agility play, you could argue, but again, the terms there, it's courage and boldness to transform. So trying to build that into the DNA or the feeling of every employee so they don't again feel concerned when we talk about a cycle of transformation that's a necessity or an imperative for the company. And then execute, of course, the usual suspect in terms of delivering excellence and outcomes uh, for all parties. Leadership and play, the tone being set, ideally leaders showing up as their best selves. We also wanted to focus on the environment that we were providing. And again, we were good students here of some of the research that Deloitte had been doing uh, through Burson. I think Josh is talking to close out the day today. But we definitely appreciate that, appreciate that the org reliance on traditional learning would always be in place, but there'd be a growing reliance on machine-enabled learning over time and, of course, social learning and uh, self-enabled learning. And this is where we saw an opportunity to partner with a company like ACAST to try and bring these components to life for us. Um, so with that in mind and knowing that we had an opportunity to kind of service the late knowledge that existed at the company, we were quite inspired by a former quote from a CEO from our own past. Uh, we embarked on launching Accelerating You, which is our LXP. Um, and for us, really, we had no money as we were coming through the inaugural cycles of change. And beyond compliance budget, we had to reach out and truly democratize how learning got done. So Edcast as a platform, as a marketplace, enable us to engage with the businesses and functions directly to say, here are utilities, here is licensed content agreements with the likes of LinkedIn Learning or Safari or Raleigh Online, for example. Please make the most of them and help pull together learning paths and channels that you think are relevant for your employees. We'll govern that to make sure there's no 
duplicated efforts. But ideally, you want to get all of your IP and all your thoughts off your SharePoints and into an ecosystem that any employee can take advantage of. So we did that. You can see in a year and a half, almost two years in, we have more than 250 channels, of which about 40 are really managed by the HR function, the traditional learning CUE. The rest are really managed by the businesses. So that was a win for us in terms of empowering the business and also scaling access to knowledge. You can see more than 150 discrete learning groups based on areas of interest or need, um, more than 30,000 users today, and about a 20% return rate each week, I think it is, based on that overall utilization. So we have a journey to go. You know, we've got some 60,000 employees now, 6,000 leaders, but we're on a path where it's more than simply a ripple. I think there is now a good level of engagement and activity around um, the platform itself. So environmentally, employees felt a little more supported, but it wasn't everything. And of course, now we have a different conundrum whereby it's out there and our leaders have been a little lazy in the last 12, 18 months because as we went out and did focus groups and did polls, what we found was employees were saying, gosh, everything is digital now. When I asked about my options, about developing capabilities, it's go have a look at accelerating you. And I feel a little left out to dry, not well supported. So it does come back down again to the quality of that human connection between leader and employee. And so we're reaching back out now to start to pull together what we're calling the people success cycle. And so we're looking to find a way to integrate an intelligent workflow that helps leaders understand their accountabilities, to connect with their people week to week, month to month, to go through your salient areas of emphasis, like performance, clarity on goals and expectations, the provision of continuous meaningful feedback, um, a doubling down on skills and the strategic skills we know are gonna be at the core of our continued transformation and how they can help their employees self-assess where they are on that continuum and then how that ties back into development clearly. Um, and then over time, succession, management, planning and, and careers so that we can really cultivate a capability mindset at the enterprise with a view to building a meaningful career paths for employees. And with this in frame, we are about to launch um, this concept, this philosophy of the imperative, of course, to perform at the heart of what you do, but it is fundamentally about learning your role and responsibility. Then when you have that in hand, not being complacent, but now begin to improve how you bring value to that work, that role, that business and or function. And again, once that's down, then it's time to move. Because what we found was, as we in particular brought new leaders or employees into the company, they would often say, gosh, there's a fair bit of bureaucracy. Things get a little stuck. And what we've noticed is often with the more tenured people who have been in a role of function for quite some time. Because they've built that process or that engine and they're kind of married to it and they're very resistant to change or any adjustments or new ways. And so we know we have a responsibility now to really cultivate this drive to create flow across the enterprise by helping leaders and all employees find different ways to apply their strengths in as many contexts as we can over time. And if we can do that, then we start to get that agile workforce and that interplay where there's the flexibility to take risks, to try new things and to apply the value you can create uh, to support others. So far, so good. I think over the last two years, as we've built out this environment, started to reshape these experiences, set a new tone really right from the top and have that echo down. We have seen quite a remarkable improvement to our engagement scores, um, almost 80, well, 18 points over the last two years, and I think a record high for the decade practically um, for the company. So we know we're on the right track, but when the spirit of, do we truly have a learning culture? I would say not just yet, despite the great gains. And you know, there's a series of questions that we continually ask ourselves, ask of our leaders, to help them stress test where they are in building out an effective learning cultural fabric. And what's gratifying about this is we get engaged in accelerated planning sessions for SLTs at the moment. Often when you ask leaders what is the legacy they want to leave behind, they're starting to use terms like, I want to leave behind a learning culture or a continuous learning engine in my organization. So we feel, hey, the message is getting out there. They're now starting to bite appropriately. It's up to us to continue to drive an experience that's real for them, relevant and meaningful. So Tim, I think that's what I wanted to share. And we can engage in some, some Q&A. Yeah, Great. excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We're called the Agile Panel. And in the spirit of being Agile, we're converting our fireside chat into speed dating. Uh. <laughs> so we're, we're going to run uh, some questions. And I wanted to start with Gunjan because you were talking, you're a CHRO, you're talking about um, an Agile workforce. and um, 
Agile can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, and you spoke briefly on that. But as a CHRO, um, what is your uh, not only definition of agile, or what do you see as the most important enablers of agility or converting your organization into an agile one? What are your key enablers? Sure, thanks. Um, so I think you can hear me. Um, I would, uh, uh, the way I would talk about agility is in terms of what we need to do on the people side to support um, our employees uh, in being uh, agile. So in, in being fast in execution, in fast in learning, fast in thinking, um, getting together as teams, uh, for example. And I would say there are basically three I, I, it's it, three simple ways in which you can support an agile um, culture as well as an a, agility in terms of the way organizations work. And the first one is essentially building your capability so that you can take away friction when employees are trying to do something. So when they are trying to execute, when they are trying to achieve the goals that they are required to do, how can you take that friction away from the workforce? So in terms of having you know, OKRs, which are aligned, which where people are aware, what they need to do, uh, where they are clear in terms of the way they actually um, work together. So when they are when they are working together, do they have to go outside of the team in a lot of decision making or can they make a lot of their decisions by themselves? So what's the team structure like? What are the goals like? Uh, what is the clarity in terms of their um, in terms of their deliverables? So that's taking away friction from employees in what they are supposed to do. So that's the first thing that we have to do. The second part is in taking away friction in what they are trying to learn. So there again, um, you know, that's where you need a platform, you need the right foundation on the infrastructure, you need the right technology stack on your learning side, where um, employees can like um, um, uh, our panelists talked about democratization, right? Where employees can go by themselves and access learning, which is curated for them. So you need to have the right taxonomy of skills. So when they go in and they access a learning, um, they, they will get the right uh, learning that they want, you need to have it aligned with also um, their their uh, their own background. So if I as an HR person go and search for um, data science training, I probably would get a different level of training uh, courses than someone who is a data scientist. So there's that bit, building the right infrastructure on the tra learning side so that you take away friction when they're trying to learn. And the last thing which is really important is how do you work with the leaders and managers so that they can provide a psychologically safe environment because you will never be agile or you'll never be able to learn and move fast if you are scared of making mistakes. When you move fast, you will make mistakes. So I think those are the three things I would say from a people perspective we have to be working on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I love that frictionless because uh, abandonment when uh, in the face of frustration is what we see more and more in the consumer market. And they bring that into the enterprise. And, and so we have to respond to that. And I really like that. Um, Frederic, I'm going to put you on the spot now. I mean, you talked a little bit about your digital transformation and showed us the lovely uh, Dan and House and the strategy that you're putting into place. How do you think you're doing in terms of building that learning culture? I mean, it's just the beginning. So we launched a lot of initiatives for the last two years. So it means we reshape all the ecosystem. So the tools, really, we were quite, uh, I will say, having an old solution, not very useful. So we have done some massive improvement of all the learning stacks. So the LMS, the launch LXP, launch a lot of solutions, try to decommission everything that was run locally to really put all together under the same umbrella. So that's what we've done, I will say, for the last years, really bring some, I will say, uniformity all across Danone in terms of solution. And also, I mean, train our people to use properly the tool because when we want to really go at certain level, data is key. And I would say all data was quite messy. So we had a huge, huge uh, program about training or learning team to properly use the solution. That was the first things, having a proper stack to be able to support then the learning culture. So now that we have this stack in, pl in place, what we're doing now, it's really launching several initiatives, global, local, to touch 
the people and explain, guys, you need to upscale yourself. What When we see what will be the business in the couple of years, if we are not able to adapt, we will be very bad for the business. So this is something we have just started. Edcast has been launched, I would say, officially two months ago. So we have a really, a really great engagement, uh, especially from local people. They like the solution because for them, it's a big change. They have came from a super, I would say, nice Excel sheet when it comes to learning. So it means not something super funky to something that now it seems, hey, I'm on Netflix. It's a little bit more interesting for me to go to learning. So we try a lot to work on the engagement part to make it really appealing. And in fact, it's really funny because Danone is a marketing company, I would say. We are selling product, FMCG. We put a lot of effort outside to sell our product, to make it really attractive for the people. When, but when it comes to learning, I don't know why, or internally for other stuff, it was not the case. So we try to use the same approach that we used to do for our clients, to do the same thing internally, to really have this call for action, guys. You are clients, you are internal clients, but you are clients. So we need to have this level of engagement. And one more thing, which is also key, when we talk about agile workforce, and this is why I'm facing right now, I need to be more agile in the way we're using this solution. It has completely changed the way we approach learning. We used to develop a lot of programs, costly programs from scratch because we are done and big company were so special. But when you look at the market, in fact, we all do kind of the same things. We have still some part which is unique, but with this type of solution, when we can create, aggregate a lot of web content that exists, we can really focus on what is unique for us. So we can spend more time on what is really beneficial to Danone and we can make more. So this is really what we're trying to do. It's just the beginning. So I'm not, we are, I mean, to be honest, I don't think we are there, a learning cult, I mean, a learning company. It will take years, but we need to start somewhere. So we are starting now. We'll have to do massive effort, engage people, put, that, put this in their daily life. I'm sure it's a really long story. It will take a couple of years, <laughs> but we don't have the choice. Because at the end, I mean, all people, agile people, if we don't give them what they want, they will be agile and go somewhere else, maybe to one of my colleagues there. So <laughs> this is key for us. So Excellent. Yeah. And I like that we talked about a frictionless experience and then we're talking about using those same marketing techniques internally uh, to attract the attention and create that employee experience. Um, and, and that kind of actually leads me to Antoine. And I warned you guys that this is going to be kind of a rapid fire kind of, of a situation. But Antoine, um, you're talking about how, you, you know, you went from 80 percent ILT or instructor led and you're trying to flip it to 20%, you're, you're actually flipping that kind of paradigm. How did, how did Mars employees accept that? And what is that, the impact of this huge transformation that you're going through on, on the ecosystem that you're looking at? So, um, so I guess you mean the learning function. A uh, absolutely, L&D, excuse me, the broader ecosystem of, of L&D. So the learning team is 250 people. Uh, actually, they were the most resistant to the change. <laughs> well, you have the IT department, wow. which, is, which is the usual yeah. one as well. But right. uh, So as long as we started with VILTs, VJLJs, they were somewhat there because they still control. They still design it. They own it. Once we started uh, with some of my team members who are in this room here uh, to present the idea of an LXP, um, there was like war in the trenches, like deep resistance. Um, because, yeah, they, they felt that they, they are in charge of the curriculum, they design and develop the curriculum, they're in charge of the facilitation and the deployment of the curriculum. And uh, that is shifting totally the onus of your development and how you learn. And so they didn't want to give, con to, to, give act to, to, to let our associates publish stuff. So we're like, I'm nuts. I mean, it's like internet where you cannot post anything. So we saw that massive dichotomy between their own behaviors as learners or as people in the real world and how they operate in, in, uh, in Mars University. So I think honestly, it took us nine months to convince them to let go. Mm -hmm. And then only after six months 
post-launch, we started to see a, a movement of acceptance and excitement, uh, even looking at the data and having some competition. It is a bit unsettling for many of them due to the new skills that you need to have around data, analytics, internal marketing, which are not necessarily the skills that they had and what they wanted to play with. Absolutely. So I think those are some of the uh, observations uh, I've had, but then I think the context of your organization that always needs to drive for lower overheads, more efficiency, that is happening everywhere, but right. starting to happen quite big time in mass also has helped us to um, reposition the relevance of MarsU and the contribution of MarsU to larger business uh, uh, needs. So I think that's what, uh, yeah, yeah. Also, some of Excellent. the and just speaking to other uh, uh, of your peers at Mars, I think that you've done a lot in, in the last two years of in, uh, increasing your brand as a disruptor. <laughs> and speaking of disruptors, <laughs> Adrian, so you just moved over to talent uh, management and you've learned a lot of lessons in the two years of deployment at EdCast. What are what is the one word of wisdom that you're turning around and passing to your predecessor in terms of what you've learned and what you'd like your predecessor, predecessor to... Oh, it's a very lovely question. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if I think about what we did, I talked about environment and experience, and uh, I think it was Roosevelt that said that people will only care how much you know when they know how much you care. And so initially as an enterprise, as we launched this, it was about demonstrating care for the employee. You know, we have your interests at heart. We're here to back you, help you develop your capabilities and skills. And so we got a good uplift from that. And then a year later, as it all became a little overwhelming and very digitized, and I laugh about the Netflix ecosystem because I can relate to that. I'll be there at lunchtime, surfing away, bookmarking things, and then learn nothing. But I've got a huge iteration of things I might want to go look at when I have time. We had to really go back to that philosophy of people will only care how much you know when they know how you care by getting those leaders now begin to think through how do you make this more relevant and as personalized as possible? Because the algorithm will get you so far, um, but only so far, because we're all so unique as human beings. So I think now moving forward, the guidance I would have for anyone engaging in a marketplace like this is I think it's an essential requirement to have that down as your foundation. But then what you do to really make it relevant is to get that human connection reoccurring at scale as much as you can. And that comes back to accountability from leaders. It comes back to how you market and drive campaigns around the assets that are available um, to nudge people along and drive some motivation. We've introduced a, a wellness Friday once a month. So once a month on a Friday at 2 p.m., employees can universally across the company log off and get engaged in something that's going to support them. And of course, one of those levers we're encouraging is development. So take the time then to go back through all of your bookmark channels or cards and try and make the most of that two to three hours um, in that time. So I think that's the main guidance. How do we now continue to drive the relevancy of what's now available by reconnecting leaders and their team members yeah. around learning and that spirit of agility and uh, learning culture establishment. Mm, that's excellent advice because when we're focusing on digital a little bit, we tend to forget that we're here for the people. Yep. And it's all about people. That's right. And we so. saw that in our feedback. The yeah. main comments were, it's all about accelerating you. Everyone just says, go to accelerating you. So leases were getting very lazy because right. um, <laughs> they had that as a thing to point at. Yeah. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Gunjan, Frederic, Antoine, and Adrian. A round of applause for everybody.